All right. Good morning, uh, Church on the Rock. Uh, this morning I have a, a message. Uh, it's going to be titled, uh, Don't End Up Being Offended at God. So I want to talk about offense at God today. This is probably going to be my uh, most controversial message uh, I've probably ever given. So I, I would ask that you guys would uh, listen all the way through it, uh, that you would search the scriptures, be Bereans, uh, pray about it, uh, because some of you may even be offended at some of the uh, things that I, I will end up saying today. And I'm going to go through this pretty methodically through my notes because I want to make sure I cover everything so there's no misunderstanding. So uh, before we get started, let's, uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. And Lord, I just ask for your, your grace. I ask for your wisdom today. I ask that you would help me to articulate your heart. Lord, that we would have a correct worldview of how you see things that we would see from eternity viewpoint and not our own and not our temporal viewpoint. Lord, I ask uh, that the, this people, Lord, would, would have ears to hear. Lord, that they would search the scriptures. And Lord, that uh, just for, for understanding and, and how to app, the application for their lives. So Lord, I ask for your help. I ask for your grace. I ask for your presence in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to start off uh, first in Matthew chapter 11. And I'm going to read the, uh, the first six uh, verses of Matthew 11. And in verse 1 it says, And after Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and to preach in the towns of Galilee. Now when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. And while verse 6 has the same meaning, I, I like it better out of the EAS version. It says, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So what would be the offense here? I would say it, it's false or uh, wrong expectations. So in the case of, of, of John the Baptist, let's just think about that. John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest man born of woman under the Old Covenant. Uh, but he had a view, uh, as did all the disciples, as far as that goes, that, that Jesus, yes, he was Messiah. He had saw the dove came down, the Holy Spirit, and rest upon Jesus. He knew he was, he was the Messiah. But his expectation was, and the disciples' expectation was that Jesus was going to set up the kingdom now and they were going to throw off the Roman Empire. And instead, John finds himself in jail and he's about to lose his head. And he's wondering, you know, this is not turning out the way I expected it to be. And so Jesus warns, you know, don't be offended by me by what I'm doing and how I work. And I think in our own lives, we can have uh, false expectations or maybe uh, expectations that we thought uh, the way he, the Lord was going to do something and he either didn't do it or maybe he didn't do it the way we thought. Uh, maybe it was a prophetic word you had at one time or, or maybe it's someone you had prayed for, a loved one you prayed for, for healing and you had faith and, and you were believing for it. And then you watch that person die. And so there's always that, that tendency that we have to be very careful that we are not offended at God because of, of false expectations are wrong in the case of John the Baptist and the disciples, just an eschatology that was not quite right. 
because again, hindsight's 2020. Now we know that Isaiah 53 is talking about the suffering servant. They did not understand that. They were looking for a Messiah to return once and set up the kingdom, and he was here. Now another uh, example is in John chapter 6. So let's turn over to John chapter 6. Now John 6 is actually a, a very long uh, passage. It's uh, actually 71 verses in, in John 6. So I'm not going to try to attempt to, to read all that. But just kind of outlining a little bit, John 6 starts with uh, Jesus doing a miracle of, of healing the, you know, the 5,000. You know, he, he has a, a multitude of 5,000 men, uh, and he tells Philip, you know, give them something. And he said, well, how in the heck are we going to do that? And, and then Jesus says, well, you know, what do you have? And, and uh, they said, well, we have two fish and five loaves. And, of course, then Jesus multiplies the, the, the food and feeds the 5,000 with, uh, with much left over. And which is a, a, a principle, by the way, too, side note, that, you know, we need our two fishes and our five loaves. You know, it's easy for some of us to say, well, God's going to take care of me. He's going to he's, he'll provide whatever the situation. I'm not going to do any preparing. Uh, sometimes there's wisdom in having your your five loaves and your two fishes. But anyway, they go on, and, and then he comes down, and later he walks on the water, uh, starting in verse 16. And, and I want to get catch up with the story back in, in verse 25 and 26. And it says that when they found him, uh, these are the people, they had, the same people have been fed, the 5,000. They have uh, gone back across the lake and found Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? In verse 26, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw a miraculous sign, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. So Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knew they were not after him. They were after what he could do for them. As we go down in, in verse 60, uh, you know, to the in between that, he's talking about that he is the bread of life and, and goes on towards the end and said, you must eat my, my flesh and drink my blood. And then in verse uh, 60, it says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, and This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the very beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time on, many disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So does that offend you, he says. And that from this time on, many turned back and refused to follow him because they were in it again for not for the sake of Jesus, not to make Jesus Lord of their life. They were in it for what Jesus could do for them. And I guess if we, we could apply that almost to uh, present day modern Christianity, where we could say maybe some of them wanted a get out of hell card, but had no uh, no desire to have Jesus become Lord of their life. And so the things that Jesus said offended them, and they ended up leaving. They departed. And so as we talk about sometimes in time, you know, there's a great harvest. There's also a great falling away coming. Now in Romans 11, 22, you don't need to turn there. I'll just quote it. But it says, Consider therefore the kindness and the sternness of God. Now I think in, in at least in our westernized, Americanized uh, Christianity, 
we consider a lot the kindness. We don't give a lot of consideration to the sternness. But it's both. It's the love of God, it's the mercy of God, it's also the sternness and the judgment of God. It's the discipline of God. You know, last week, Scott talked about, gave a little example of, of, of the Old Testament of Uzzah. Remember, Uzzah was a guy who, uh, as David was bringing the ark back and, and it started to tilt, and he reached out to steady it, and when he touched it, he, he instantly was killed. And uh, David was really upset. Uh, and we think, well, yeah, but, you know, that, that was Old Testament, and uh, uh, things, are, things are different now. Well, let's look at uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. We won't turn there. I'm just going to tell you the story. You can look it up later. Uh, but at actually, in the, in the very end of chapter 4, it talks about Barnabas uh, bringing, selling property, bringing the, uh, the finances in and putting at the at apostles' of feet uh, so they could distribute it to the poor and those who were in need of it. And a lot of people were doing that. And that's the first time we actually have Barnabas uh, showing up in Scripture. And so Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they sell a piece of property for X number of dollars, we'll say. Uh, but they conspire within themselves. They say, okay, we're, well, we're going to keep some of this money back for ourselves. And then we're going to tell the church that we sold the property for such and such, and this is what we're giving all of it. And so as they come in and they, they bring it up uh, before Peter, and then Peter instantly knows and he says, uh, why have you conspired together to lie to the Holy Spirit? And he says, the property was yours before you sold it. You didn't, in other words, you didn't have to sell it, you could just kept it. Or you could have sold the property, kept some of the money, and give them the rest. But what you have done is lied to the Holy Spirit. You have lied and brought, said you brought the whole, the whole amount of the sale from that land. And immediately it says that Ananias fell down dead. The young men come, they pick him up, they take him out to bury him. It says about three hour period went by and Sapphira comes in and she doesn't know what what has happened and so she comes in and to the church and comes up and Peter asks her hey did you uh you guys uh, you and your husband Anna so you, you sold this land for such and such a price and you brought the full amount here and she said yes that's right and he says uh the feet of the young men who just buried your husband are now at the door and they're going to bury you and she immediately falls down dead. And the young men come and bury her. And it says, great fear came upon the church. Now that's a New Testament example of God's judgment. Now there's a, there's a, a, a spiritual principle there. And that is uh, that what you get away with in the outer courts can get you killed in the holy of holies. In other, how, in other words, how we live now and how we, uh, our, our relationship and the, the fear of God that we have now compared to when the Holy Spirit is poured out, where signs and wonders are happening, where miracles and creative miracles are happening, there's a lot higher standard. That's when we need to come before him with clean hands and a pure heart, with godly motives. I can also think in the Old Testament, another example uh, would be Nahab and Abihu, who were the, uh, the two sons of Aaron. You know, they were the two priests. And uh, it says, uh, I think that's in Leviticus uh, chapter 10, it says, they brought strange fire. In other words, they offered incense, they offered, but not according to God's way that he instructed them to do. And it says, fire fell from heaven and consume them. And then the Lord told Moses to tell Aaron not to grieve for them. 
that he was to be treated holy. And those who minister him must be holy. And you know, as, as last week Scott was going over, uh, reading some verses out of Haggai, and I was thinking as, as he was reading that, about what some of the, uh, there'd be some Christians probably today would say, uh, just like today, they're so quick to say, well, no, that's not God, it's Satan that's doing this, whether it's the virus or, or whatever. And in, and in that passage through Haggai, he says, uh, very clearly says, I sent the drought. I sent the mildew. It was God. And I, I would think some of these, if they were living Christians uh, in that day, would say, no, 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 it's not, it's not God. And with, with very clearly, it was God who said, I did this. And that offends us. And sometimes I think they may feel like they need to uh, uphold God's honor, uh, his character or something. God doesn't need us to defend him. He is sovereign and he is Lord. And if you do not have a, a correct worldview of God and how he has worked throughout history, how he has worked through from Genesis, through Revelation, you can very well end up offended at the things that God is going to be doing. And it's something that we need to know, not only just us, but I think our children and our grandchildren need to know as, as these years begin to unfold. And I think it's different examples, you know, throughout Scripture. We can go whether it was a flood where the whole human race was wiped out except for eight people, no one in his family. I think of the Amorites, you know, where, when uh, Abraham came into the to land and, and, and the Lord promised to give him this land and to his descendants. But he said it wasn't, wouldn't be for 400 years because it says the sins or the iniquities of the Amorites has not reached its fullness yet. So he was giving them time, but, the, but once those sins reached a certain point, then God's judgment was going to be poured out. And in this case, it was the Israelites who was going to bring judgment upon the Amorites. Then we have the examples of, of Israel and Judah. Now, in the case of Israel, uh, after being warned by prophets over and over, uh, Assyria, an evil, idol-worshipping nation, evil nation, uh, brutal nation, is allowed to come in and destroy the capital of Samaria, carry away those who survived into slavery, and Israel, the northern kingdom, ceased to exist. Same thing for Judah, which happened later uh, through the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, again, an idol-worshipping, heathen, evil people were used as a tool of judgment upon Judah. And they were carried into captivity for, for a period of 70 years. I can think of uh, in AD 70 when uh, the Roman em Empire, the Roman legions under Titus came and, and they uh, destroyed Jerusalem burnt the temple. Uh, this is said that over a, Josephus says over a million Jews were killed. The rest were taken in captivity throughout the Roman Empire. And as Jesus was going on his way to the cross, carrying the cross, and remember where the women were weeping behind him, and he says, he turned and says, don't weep for me, daughters of, Jer daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, for the day is coming, because he's foresaw what was going to be coming upon Jerusalem for the for rejecting their Messiah. And the the word says that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It also says I do not change. And there has been among certain segments of Christianity a, a look at the Old Testament as the God of wrath in the New Testament, the God of love. 
But no, he was just as much the God of love in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. He's also the God of discipline and judgment in the New Testament, just like he was in the Old Testament. He does not change. I want to go to Jeremiah. This is going to be our actually our last scripture. Jeremiah chapter 16. And I would suggest uh, for you guys, if you never spent much time in the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets, because it's not just history you're reading. It, it's things uh, that have happened and things that are yet to happen. Uh, many of them have, have multiple uh, uh, fulfillments and some that we have not seen yet. But in the passage in Jeremiah that I want to read, I'm going to read the uh, 1 through 15. And this chapter is kind of titled Disaster and Promise for Judah. So Israel, at this time, Israel has already gone. The northern kingdom has already been taken in captivity by the Syrian. They're, they're in the dustbin of history. So Judah, southern kingdom, is the one is left. And Jeremiah has been warning. And the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, chapter 16, verse 1. And it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. You must not marry and have sons or daughters in this place. For this is what the Lord says about the sons and the daughters born in this land and about the women who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. They will die of, a, of deadly disease. They will be like refuge lying on the ground. They will perish by sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for the birds of the air and the beast of the earth. For this is what the Lord says, Do not enter a house where there is a funeral mill. Do not go to mourn or to show sympathy, because I have withdrawn my blessing, my love, and my pity from this people declares the Lord. Both high and low will die in this land. They will not be buried or mourned, and no one will, will cut himself or shave his head for them. No one will offer food to comfort those who mourn for the dead, not even for a father or a mother, nor will anyone give them a drink to console them. Verse 8, <clears throat> And do not enter a house where there is feasting, <clears throat> and sit down to eat and drink. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Before your eyes and in your days, I will bring an end to the sound of joy and gladness and to the voices of the bride and the bridegroom in this place. When you tell these people all this, and they ask you, <clears throat> Why has the Lord decreed such a great disaster among us? What wrong have we done? What sin have we committed against the Lord our God? Then say to them, It is because your fathers forsook me, declared the Lord, and they followed other gods, and they served and worshipped them. They forsook me, and they did not keep my law. But you have behaved more wickedly than your fathers. See how each of you is following the stubbornness of his own heart instead of obeying me. So I will throw you out of this land into a land neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you will serve other gods day and night. For I will show you no favor. But he also leaves them with a, with a promise. So he tells them disaster is coming, and it is going to be a terrible disaster. But in verse 14, he says, However, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, As surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he 
had banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their forefathers. So a great disaster was coming on God's people. And they were God's people. They were his covenant people. And the Lord brought disaster upon them, judgment and a discipline, but also a promise that he would once again restore them to the land. So as horrific as that was, reading through that, God also had a promise and he has a purpose in it. Now I want to, because sometimes we look at things like that, we look at uh, things from the Old Testament, we look at the destruction of, of Israel and Judah, and we think, well, yeah, but that was Old Testament. Uh, I mean, that's, that's so far in the past, it, it really doesn't affect us, or we don't maybe feel it. And so I want to bring that a little closer to home. Uh, this is where we get into uh, even a more controversial area. I want to take a look at the most extreme event in modern history, the Holocaust, where six million Jews were exterminated. Now, as we look at the Holocaust and look at what happened, there, there were three powerful forces that were at work at this. One was God's judgment. Two was man's sin or his depravity. And the third part was Satan's rage. I uh, have a book with me. I think I read this probably about 1999. It's called Holocaust, Where Was God? And it is by uh, Arthur Katz, or Art Katz, uh, to tell you who he was. First, he was a Jewish. In fact, no one else could have, a Gentile could not have written this book. Uh, I would not touch it with a 10-foot pole if it was a Gentile. Art Katz was a, a Jewish intellectual who also happened to be a Christian. He believed in Yeshua as his Messiah. He was also a, a, a preacher of righteousness. He was a holiness preacher. Uh, I remember when he, I got the chance to hear him a couple different times in the probably early mid 80s uh, when he'd come to Kansas City. Uh, and he was very well respected by the pastors in the region. But at the same time, they were almost a little afraid of him because he was such a holiness preacher. I mean, he'd preach hell and he'd preach it at hot. But this book could not have been written again by anyone but a Jew to be accepted at all. And what I want to do is, starting with that, when we talked about, I said the three different forces that were at work, first one being uh, judgment, God's own judgment. And I want to read a little bit out of uh, chapter two of this book. And it was titled, um, What is God's Judging? Nope, I'm sorry, that's chapter 3. Chapter 2 is the God of Judgment. And these are questions that he had to ask himself and he had to, to search out. And it starts, it says, The issue of the Holocaust raises very great questions. Why did God not intervene in the midst of our unspeakable sufferings? Let me say this too. This book, again, written by a Jewish person, is primarily written to the Jewish people, although it's for everyone. So why did God not intervene in the midst of our unspeakable suffering? Where was God, who claimed to be omnipresent, all-powerful, and all-knowing. Did he not see the horrific tragedy that allowed his covenantal people to be systematically annihilated in the most bestial and cruel destruction that has ever come upon a people? 
How could the long-awaited Messiah have come, as Christians have told us, and yet allowed the decimation of his own people? Where is the mercy of the New Testament God? If this kind of thing could take place in modern times through the auspices of a Christian nation, Lutheran Germany, what kind of a God is he whom we thought to be righteous, merciful, and just, who could look down upon the horror and allow it? How could God be God and this take place? He says, I begin to take up these questions, which can be summed up in this all-consuming statement. Why was God silent? If Nazi soldiers threw Jewish infants up in the air and caught them on their bayonets, if they shot them in the air for target practice, if they took infants out of the arms of their mothers and threw them alive into troughs of burning gasoline, then I was left with only two options, either to agree with many commentators that God is dead or accept the testimony of our scripture that God's silences are in direct portion to our sin. I had then to consider the Holocaust as judgment, that it was neither an aberration nor a historical accident, and that somehow the magnitude of our suffering is directly related proportionally to the magnitude of our sin. Can there be only one meaning then for the Jewish suffering? namely the judgment of God on a people who have forsaken the true knowledge of him and who have not walked in his covenants nor fulfilled their obligation to be his witness people. It was a very, remember, a very challenging book, but also a very eye-opening book. A couple of quotes from him that I thought was very significant. And he says, God's severest judgments are ever redemptive. His severity is his mercy. Let me read that again. What do you think about that? God's severest judgment are ever redemptive. His severity is his mercy. You know, when you're in the middle of it, I don't think you see it as mercy. But again, that's because we're looking at it from a temporal point of view. He's looking at it from an eternal view. Another thing he said was that we must view God's judgment from eternity and not from a temporal view. It is better to burn here than to burn in hell for eternity. And when you think of that, because, you know, the, the Lord said that Israel is the apple of God's eyes. You know, it's, it's the, our Savior's kinfolk. It's his brethren. But again, to whom much is given, much is required. And as I think of our nation, I think how much has been given to us as a nation. You know, there have been never been uh, a people on earth who has lived in such prosperity as we have lived up to this point. The things that are, would be unimaginable throughout most of human history. We have been given much. But much is also required. I said there's three different forces at work. God's judgment was one of them. Man's depravity, which is, is Hitler's uh, hatred, for one thing, of the Jews. I have another book, uh, read, yeah, I'm kind of a history freak, so read a lot of history. I, I like to know what happened, why it happened, how it happened, what were the forces in it. Uh, this one is called Hitler's Cross. 
And uh, it says that, you know, the broken cross, the symbol of Nazi Germany, became the vivid icon under which Adolf Hitler united his destitute and pride starved nation. As the Führer, supreme leader of the Reichstag, Hitler rejoiced that the swastika was openly displayed in churches throughout Germany. Confused at first by their responsibilities, then deceived by their pride, many church leaders capitulated to the wave of nationalism that swept the cross of Jesus Christ from the rightful place. Others did not and paid the ultimate price for upholding the truth. So this is the book that, that talks about how the Nazis were able to co-op uh, the church, primarily the Lutheran church, into doing its will, where they would actually have on their altar the swastika would be presented, and how they silenced the church from speaking anything about what was happening, and especially what's happening to the Jewish people. Now, there were some that stood up. There were people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred right before the end of the war, who stood violently against and, and preached the truth. And there were others who did. Unfortunately, they were a minority. It was just a remnant. Second, the third one, I said, said man's depravity again, being Hitler and what they were doing. The third part is Satan's rage. Now, it's interesting that if you look and study uh, the history of Nazism, you will see that they were, uh, they were into the occult big time. They were idol worshipers. They, they worshiped demons. And they were empowered by demons. Uh, there's a lot of research that has to do with that. And so Satan used Nazis, Nazism, for his purposes. Now think about it from Satan's viewpoint. Now Satan knows that uh, if there is no Israel, Jesus cannot return. If there are new Jew, if there are new any not any Jews left, Jesus can't return. So one of his primary objections is to keep that from happening, from Israel ever becoming a nation again, from the Jews. He wants to exterminate them just as he would all Christians. So he has a motive in that. He has a rage against Christians and against the Jewish people. And so all three forces are working. You got God's judgment, you got man's depravity and man's sin, and you also have Satan's rage or Satan's uh, plan and his purposes all working together. Now, it's interesting, there's one positive thing that came about as a result uh, of the Holocaust. And that was the fact that, that, um, that after the, such a hideous tragedy had occurred, the nations felt like they needed to provide uh, a homeland for the Jewish people. And so they began to make the moves to open the door where the Jews could go back to Palestine and eventually, of course, in 1948, uh, establish the nation of Israel. But I want to read one last scripture out of the same chapter that we just read, uh, Jeremiah 16. Just after that promise that, that, that the Lord had given them, that he would bring them back to the land, I want to read verse 16. And it says, But now I will send for many fishermen, declares the Lord. And they will catch them. And after that, I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them down on every mountain and hill and from the crevices of the rock. One interpretation or, or one uh, picture of this is one possible fulfillment, there's more yet to come, is that if you take the picture of a fisherman, fisherman throws in bait, throws in lures, trying to lure the fish to catch the fish. As we look at God wanting to reestablish the nation of Israel, and Israel as his capital, 
hadn't been, hasn't happened, hadn't been a nation since 70 AD. There were the fishermen who were the Zionists back in the 1920s. They were uh, a, a group of Jews who, who wanted to get the Jewish people to return to Palestine, and, and many of them, not many, a, a small minority of, of Jews were doing that. They were going back to Palestine. Most of the Jews didn't have any desire to go back. Why? Because Palestine at that time was a, was a third world country. I mean, a broken down desert. Uh, and the Jewish people who were living in Germany, in Europe, they were doing great. Finances, finances were good. Their lives were good. Uh, everything was good. There's no way they were going to go back. Had any desire to go back. So then the Lord sends the hunters. And after all their resources, their money, their finances, their house, six million of them killed, uh, the Jews were, many were more than willing, then begin to make that aliyah to go back to Jerusalem. As God removed all those props, all those things that kept them back from going. And so he established his purposes. And it's very interesting as we look at that, as we see that, that now uh, we now don't have the, the state of Israel. And then in 1967, Jerusalem uh, came under Israeli control. And then, what, just a year or two ago, uh, Trump claims Jerusalem as the capital and recognizes it, the capital city of Israel, as we begin to move forward in these end times. So what we see coming is there, there's these increasing birth pains. And I think we also have crops that have been under us. And you know, last week Scott was talking about the refiner's fire. And I was thinking about some of these things that's been removed, you know, like uh, uh, entertainment, sports. You know, we have sports fans, you know, and I'm a sports fan. You know, that word fan actually stands for fanatic. Have, have those things, has entertainment, has, has culture, has cur culture, you know, uh, personalities become uh, idols in a way? Has God removed some of those things from us? There are times that are coming, you know, as I've talked about several times now, about the birth pains, about the the increase of intensity of the birth pains and the increased frequency of the birth pains. We are never going back to 2019. That's in the rearview mirror now. There's going to be more shakings coming, and we have to realize that God's hand is in it, and there is a purpose in it, and we want to make sure that we are not offended at what he's doing. We must see, not from our own viewpoints, because look, the scripture says his ways are way above our head. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We see from a temple. We see from here right now what's affecting us. He sees from eternal viewpoint. So it's important as we go forward not to be offended at what the God's gonna be doing. You can read the book of Revelations. You can go back through the prophets there are still many, several things yet to be fulfilled, and there's going to be shakings. And as I said before, it's going to be the worst of times, but it's also going to be the best of times. And you were made for such a time as this. You may not have picked this time to live, but God has picked this time. So let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this people. Lord, I just ask that... Uh, the Lord, we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. I ask, Lord, that you would help us see from your viewpoint that we would see from eternity. So, Lord, help us. Grant us grace, Lord. Grant us, grant us your power to stand strong in times of shaking, knowing that you are in control, that none of these things that are going on has taken you by surprise, and that you have a plan and you have a purpose in it. And Lord, we long to be part of that great 
harvest of souls that's going to be coming into the kingdom. And I ask that you protect your people from also that the great falling away that will happen concurrently. So, Lord, we thank you for your plans. We thank you for your purposes. We don't always understand them. We don't always see correctly. But, Lord, we say we trust you. And, Lord, we give you our lives and our hearts. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.